Do you know what this is? Looks like snowboard goggles that don't work. <laughs> These are virtual reality goggles. You can strap them on and then you can play games or you can go oh, into a virtual world. Would you uh, see yourself wearing those? I mean, not in public. I, I, yeah, I think I'd have a hard time wearing them, you know, to walk, but I'd That's wear right. them to try them. They look, they look soft enough, yes. But now, this company has just been purchased by Facebook. Does that make a difference how you feel about it? Hopefully that means they'll be free. Hello there and welcome to the Oculus Infomercial Hour, wholly owned by Facebook. I'm Dragster Zuckerberg. With me in the studio is Frau Joe Palmer. Lucky. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was rather lame. This is the Drax Files Radio Hour with Joey Yardley. My name is Dragster Debray. Uh, a rift has been caused uh, because of our incessant coverage of a pair of popular VR goggles. Yeah, it's not It's not really like we've got a choice in the matter because, you know, we are talking about the meta first and about second life and virtual worlds. And there is no escaping the Oculus Rift. It is everywhere. And uh, the Facebook Oculus deal, in case you, you lived under a, a virtual rock, we do need to talk about this. Um, Facebook has acquired uh, Oculus Rift for $2 billion US dollars, and there is a lot of strong opinion on both sides. We have a lot of linkage, but Joe, your personal opinion? I don't know. Most of us are not that keen on Facebook, but on the other hand, what they are doing is going to help the Oculus Rift and VR in general uh, get there a lot faster and probably a lot cheaper so you know everyone is being very cynical and just not trusting uh, Zuckerberg and Palmer Lucky not trusting what they're saying and I, yeah, maybe I'm just a naive innocent sweet young girl but I, I'm sort of t tempted to believe them at least for now and you know the proof is in the pudding they're using a lot of verbiage like open and and such and a little bit later we'll have John Bruchard on prominent SL uh, architect who is now working a lot with Unity. Uh, he's going to share his opinion. Very interesting conversation I had with him yesterday. Uh, I, I got to admit, I also, I mean, I do use Facebook, but I'm uh, not a, a Facebook fan, uh, certainly not of their dominance in the market, of the huge amount of data that they uh, amass. And um, what to me stood and still stands out about Second Life is the fact that you have avatar-based representation and you can peel back the onion at your own pace, right? So so you might uh, offer someone um, the, your real, quote unquote, real identity, or you may stay within your second life identity. Um, choosing your identity and playing with that identity in a playful way, again, this is also speculation. But if you look at Facebook's model and what Zuckerberg has said uh, publicly many times, um, I, I, am, I am a bit concerned if they are, in fact, going to be the only one player in that VR space and they have that power. I think we have to look at how Facebook is going to make money on this. I don't think they're going to make money out of the Oculus Rift itself, you know, the headset. Um, I think they're going to make money out of a service they will be providing like Facebook. Um, to me, it, it, it is a bit like Facebook is thinking we are going to create a 3D virtual version of Facebook or a virtual world, which would be a bit of a problem for Second Life. Um, and that's how we are going to make our money. And to do that, we're going to help Oculus Rift get there as fast as possible and we're going to throw all this money and tech know-how at them. Um, so I think the Oculus Rift itself and the technology uh, is pretty safe and will probably remain independent as the, you know both parties have been saying up to a certain level of course. Facebook is then going to offer them a face world or whatever they're going to call it and that's and that's how they're going to make their money and I, I hope that just like with Facebook we all have the choice to uh, decide not to use it at some point you don't have a choice though yeah but we're in second life and linden lab also knows everything about us <laughs> you're absolutely right yeah just smaller you know we're being watched uh, all the time and i've been pretty cynical about what i put on the internet since i first started my modem well as you know i'm an uh, idealist and i don't like the status quo and i like to be in a world where we do have uh, freedoms and where we do have oversights and where we don't live in a corporatocracy so what i wrote down and i think 
think I posted that on Facebook. Of course, the irony is not lost on me <laughs> that I'm commenting negatively on the Facebook Oculus deal on Facebook itself. I posted something like the nightmare scenario for me is drooling soccer moms with Oculus spending tons of dough on Farmville in 3D of a virtual dictatorship complete with facial recognition, narrow cookie cutter profiles and no escape of commercial pressures and algorithms that tell you what you like or should like. The end of free expression as we know it and privacy you are um, doing what a lot of people are doing and that's overreacting no well yeah that but you always do that so that's okay that's you are confusing facebook to surface with facebook the company you know everyone's talking about virtual farm fill and i think that's you know that's going to happen anyway with or without facebook at this very moment all we've got is a company and i think they are going to design something completely new something that is nothing like facebook and that's how they are going to make their money not with the oculus itself and i think that is even more worrying than a virtual facebook yes because what alternative is there you know what kind of thing could they be developing and i think they may actually be thinking of creating a virtual world well, that is worrying, but that's what I'm saying, because then we do, we have a completely corporate controlled world where we have beautiful experiences. Even bigger problem is that Linden Lab can absolutely not compete with a competition like that. They will build their virtual world and we don't know if they're going to uh, allow people complete freedom to build whatever they want. But if they do, you know, Second Life can just pack it in. <laughs> That's a good point, but I would say, and later on, we also have Maria Korolov from the Hypergrid. We taped this a couple of weeks ago, but it's eerily um, uh, prophetic in the sense that she talks a lot about who is going to come out of left field and build something huge. Uh, as a response to what you just said, Joe, I would say maybe that's exactly the opportunity for Second Life and for Linden Lab to position themselves as the more creative little world right so if facebook creates this huge world that is super shiny and awesome but very very sort of cookie cutter and not a lot of creative freedom let alone the privacy maybe linden lab could position themselves as wait a minute if you want privacy if you want uh complete artistic uh, expressive freedom come to us let's hope they're going to do that but if they if they are going to offer freedom as well um you know in exchange for you know, everyone in Second Life is complaining about the tier. What if Facebook says, yeah, of course, we're going to have a little bit of advertising, but you're going to get a, a region with 10,000 prims for $5 a month. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in Second Life who's going to say, uh, I'll give up a bit of my freedom for that. No, absolutely. If 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 reality if reality show, uh, can tell us anything, that's uh, is people want free stuff. Another option is that if Facebook is actually really looking into creating their own virtual world at the moment. They may even uh, start looking to, uh, towards buying Second Life or the Open Grid. That's what my wife said this morning. It's interesting. She said, are they going to buy Linden Lab? It would not be a surprising next step. And remember, not that long ago, Cloud City, uh, was it it's called Cloud City? Party. It was a party. Everyone was, everyone was invited, but nobody showed up. Uh, Cloud Party was uh, bought by Yahoo not that long ago and then killed. Uh, but the people who, from Cloud Party are still working on something. Yahoo isn't stupid. I think everyone in the business knows that virtual reality is coming and it's going to be really, really, really big and they all want in. You know, I would not be surprised if within five years um, there is going to be more virtual worlds. Well, if the market actually has is going to create more diversity starting with this deal and uh, then you know I'm I'm all for it meantime we have we have to move on we have so many links you blogged a lot about it you collected a lot next week we'll also talk to Jinsu Yoon or June is it June Yoon or June we'll we'll find out uh, formerly Jinsu Linden VP of corporate development he has a great blog post also about the Oculus acquisition as it relates to second life and of course there's no sh shortage of articles um out there that now of course um, mention second life in a in one sentence or less uh you know remember second life that didn't work out so what do you expect of course i couldn't help myself and had to respond to a few of those things of course i'll do that later after we tape i'll spend five hours on this it drives me <laughs> it drives me so crazy it does because again you know I've, I've heard someone say you can't compare uh the graphics of second life with the demos of the oculus rift I've tried one of those demos and it was absolutely awesome, but the graphics, I've, 
I've seen much better in Second Life. It is clear that you know, there is another journalist who hasn't looked at Second Life since 2007. I had a chance to try the Oculus now for a week, and I just wanted to share uh, my, my initial feedback. Did you get a chance to try it uh, yet, Joe? No, unfortunately, I, I have got it uh, for a week as well. I've tried it, I tried a demo once, but unfortunately my real life is so hectic. I know I run my own company and I'm a time traveler. So it, it was, I just haven't had time to try it again because it wasn't quite working. So I need some technical white boy to come and help me fix it. So let me, let me just briefly say that trying the Oculus Rift in Second Life is utterly fascinating and an amazing experience. Having said that, though, if you don't have a connection to your avatar or to the community, it's almost a prerequisite, I think, to enjoy it. That's for sure. But it's a no-brainer that interfacing an SL with, with, with this type of hardware is, is amazing. I mean, I visited 1920s Berlin. I visited The Inevitability of Fate by Rose Bukowski. I mean, immersive art, There, it's, it's a no-brainer. It is just amazing. You look around, you're in there, and audio plays a big role. Uh, Joe, your sim and also the Basilik sim, where Paradise Lost, the theater production, will will premiere in a couple of weeks. We'll talk more about that later. They have a lot of ambient audio. Yeah? There are street noises, there is noises of uh, the seagulls and the sea. So when you're in there and your experience is this with the rift and the audio is right, it's just absolutely amazing. I'm talking a lot with the people in the Oculus Rift group in Second Life. And if you've got an Oculus Rift, make sure you, sh you join the group. And uh, people were discussing about how they, you know, while they were using it and although they are not very happy with the user interface at the moment and they like me think that we need a completely new basic uh, interface um, we need it even more now for the Oculus Rift users but the overall experience of being in Second Life with the Oculus is blowing everyone away. That I would agree with and I spoke to Loki Elliott yesterday in World a little bit. I think a basic viewer uh, would is warranted. However, the complexity of Second Life um, and the stuff you can do with it, I, I don't know, I really have, have no answer how to do this. Basically you can forget typing, forget it. Uh, doing typed searches and stuff like that it's a complete chore especially with those newer keyboards that are slick and you know very little um tactile uh, information sent back to your brain it's uh, it's undoable i would wish there was a special hud with, with visual cues about inventory for instance right so you don't you see your inventory with little visual cues that pop up um stuff like that but again, if you use voice, for instance, and you have a conversation with another avatar, it's it's amazing. It is completely insane. Yeah, I can imagine that. And, and, and really, let me add one more thing, because this is not talking out of an Oculus fanboy type of mindset here. Let's just say head-mounted displays with accurate tracking and combined with something like a leap motion. That to me, it's a no-brainer. We don't have, even have to debate that. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to say that as well. Of course, we're saying Oculus twenty-four times a second, um, but that's because it is the the headset of the moment. And don't get me wrong, um, sorry Palmer if you're listening, um, but I really don't care which headset I'll be using uh, for the rest of my life. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that there's going to be a dozen of them available in a year or two. But I would also like to say that I think that um, the communication is so important and we haven't quite fixed it yet for Second Life. And we have to realize that a lot of people don't want or no, can't use their voice um, in Second Life. So I, I think Linden Lab should look into um, perhaps voice recognition software. I think um, Loki spoke to me and he said uh, on my Mac computer, and I have that as well, uh, it has voice recognition software in the computer. And he was actually trying it out while we were talking and he, he was saying things to his computer and his computer would change it into chat text that was amazing and that was you know and i think that may be a, a really really interesting thing for linden lab to look at everybody who is now in the virtual world space has to somehow solve the problem how do i communicate if i can't type we should probably mention that uh, this just in and we didn't mention this at the top of the hour that philip rosedale uh, founder of second life and linden lab said that his high fidelity virtual world is going to work with oculus rift right off the box yeah. 
I think he's also at least another year away from making anything um, that can be used. I know that a few people have tried it and are very impressed. But, you know, I think Second Life is already running behind and that they have to race to keep up. And, you know, High Fidelity hasn't even started yet. So it's it's it's, it's going to be a very exciting couple of years and uh, win or lose for everyone, I think. All right, please comment um, and let us know what you think if you're in the Oculus group, if you tried it with Second Life, what are the issues with the UI? Uh, what can be improved? Uh, widely, Linden is, is listening to this program as are other Lindens who are working on this project. And I'm sure they're really grateful for productive uh, feedback on the issue. I promise I'll try and get it to work again this week and then I'll talk about it next week uh, bot girl questy a prominent second life mm, let's call her a philosopher has a great blog post on linen lab advertising and imvu and she embedded a, an imvu corporate uh, video which i think is great and i wish linen lab would do something like that you, it, we always make fun of imvu not fun but we we put it down in the sense that we're better than them but i'm telling you when you watch this um i am i am view uh, a video from their headquarters and the employees speak directly in the camera and uh, they just show the climate what they're working on they show their avatars and how much fun they have something like this would go a long way if linen lab would do something like this would be really nice and um i have to say that i view looks okay in that video but i mean it's not the kind of virtual world that we want because we want more freedom i've seen conan o'brien dancing uh, in imvu uh, on one of his shows you know somehow imvu has escaped bad press that we've got exactly because i'm absolutely sure that imvu is used for exactly the same weird things that we do in second life And, you know, it's everyone looks like a Barbie and they're all doing hanky-panky and all that sort of thing. But yet somehow they manage to uh, uh, seem a nice, great, fun, friendly bunch of lovely thingies. Uh, now, real quick, you, you sent something about the Sulon Cortex headset. It is another virtual reality headset and this one has pretty much everything it has a camera it has motion tracking and what this has also it has an outward facing camera if i'm correct and yeah. uh, either complete immersion or have some sort of overlay basically walking through berlin let's say and then teleporting yourself into the 30s with with maybe some non-player characters the idea behind this is that you can combine or choose between augmented reality and virtual reality and of course that's where the big money is and i think that that's where we will eventually go because um you know i don't care much for augmented reality i want virtual reality full immersion but i can imagine that if you have one headset that you can use as some sort of google glass uh, walking outside and you come home and you use it for virtual reality that would be quite interesting as you just said if i want to go to uh you know, visit a historical part of the city and flick a switch and suddenly I see an overlay of uh, historical figures walking through that city. Or, you know, I, I have a button that replaces all the ugly modern 1970s architecture buildings with lovely original old buildings. With a voice command, you could say, computer, remove all orange. Oh, Im imagine if I could have a switch and walk down the street and I can say, computer, make everyone wear 1930s clothes. Oh, I'd be so happy. Oh, what we completely forgot, our Leap Motion giveaway. Uh, we gave away a Leap Motion. We had a little um, question that was uh, successfully answered by a handful of people. And the winner is, here's the tape from the drawing. Okay, let's do this like a boss. Um, can you please put your hand into this box? This is the box with pieces of paper that have the na names of the potential winners on it, the people who have the ans guessed the answer right. By the way, the right answer was, of course, Electrobit City. Electrobit City was the uh, right answer. And open the piece of paper, please. Can you read the name? Mm. Try it. Uh, Shetty Balaidale. <laughs> okay, my handwriting is terrible. Skeffy, Skeffy Blaisdale. Congratulations, Skeffy. I'll try to write better next time. So, congrats, Skeffy Blaisdale. Congratulations. Send us info how to get the leap out to you. We're giving away another one today just for Second Life folks who leave a voicemail on Skype telling us about how they feel about Facebook and Oculus. If it's a good thing for virtual worlds in general, if it's a good thing or a bad thing for Second Life in particular moving forward. 
All right, interview with John Bruchard. He's an architect and early Second Life pioneer. I worked with him even prior to the Kansas to Cairo project. Check out arcvirtual.com, his blog. He now does a lot of architectural uh, visualization projects, mainly in Unity 3D. And I called him up to get his opinion on the Facebook Oculus deal. Let's listen to that. Right now, what VR needs is mainstream awareness, you know, not necessarily adoption, but just awareness. And this has certainly put it on, on the big map. You know, it's it's um, very front and center in the in the forefront of a lot of people's um, attention right now, which is which is only a good thing. I think the amount of cash that they're bringing to the table, I think, is also a good thing. Developing hardware is a very, very expensive thing to do, whether or not. Facebook is able to pull this off or not, I don't. I think is irrelevant in a way. I think people are making a bigger deal of it than they really should be insofar as if Facebook drops the ball, at this point, so many people are aware of it that someone's going to do something. You know, it's, it's going to happen one way or another now. Now, I am using Facebook myself, but at the same time, I'm very critical and I see with... Um concern not only facebook but other big companies google and such that are so dominating and so necessary seem to be very necessary for our daily lives have this enormous power and that's one of those things that i'm really concerned about and you remember all this talk about second life being a walled garden it's run by one company and and you know the, there's still that that sentiment oh linden lab is that they're 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 keeping us down the man is keeping us down but now we're talking about a behemoth and so my concern and it's echoed w within the second life community certainly that a big company is is taking over an entire segment and then just sort of making their own thing and then you have to be in it and play by their rules is is that what the future holds i think everything you said is true except the fact that you have to be in it and play by the rules you don't have to and that's the big differentiation that i think a lot of people are missing out nobody's forcing you to go on facebook and nobody's forcing you to share pictures of your kids and your cats and you know we're doing it because it's a value added proposition to have a free service to communicate with each other in a more meaningful way than we can with any other platform at this point. So we're voluntarily signing up. And if you don't like the loss of freedom and you like that privacy, then then Facebook isn't for you. They, they, they know that they have to be very, very careful in balancing the value that they're adding with the, the any sort of advertising or any sort of monetization. And if they don't, and if they disrupt that balance, it isn't going to work. You've seen the stream of, of comments and even the um Marcus Pearson from Minecraft said uh, I w we were going to do something with Oculus, but we're not going to do it because Facebook creeps us out. It's really hard to be a big, successful tech company these days. <laughs> There's a lot of people that are uh, that want perfection. And, and it's yeah, it's a it's a it's a very difficult tightrope. I am worried, though, because now when we're talking virtual reality and you uh, know uh, more than anyone how powerful it can be, I guess we have to understand or do we know yet what that means that oculus is now owned by facebook does it then still mean that i can use the oculus for another tiny little world or an open sim i, I guess i have a number of, con of moderate concerns but my biggest concern is that if they don't maintain the openness and accessibility that that there is right now with the oculus i think it'll be a big misstep and i, I don't think they're going to do that and both mark and palmer and everybody who's been speaking in, in an official capacity on this matter has stated very clearly that oculus Oculus is going to remain independent. You are, of course, a, uh, a, a Second Life uh, cele celebrity in the sense that that you have pushed this forward as far as it gets. I mean, this is my uh, opinion, and you've done so much amazing work in it, and 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 you remain every time you you speak publicly. I hear you very passionate about the uh, Second Life culture and all what it stands for. What do you think this means for Second Life? And then in addition, because this show is also about OpenSim a little bit, about these types of technologies. I think it, it makes it more evident than ever that Second Life was ex was very far ahead of its time. And just earlier today, I was asked to produce some images of some of the projects that we're doing. And I went back to my Flickr page and I'm scrolling through and I'm scrolling back and I'm seeing all the Unity stuff and the OpenSim stuff and I'm back into Second Life, you know, and it makes in in light of the newest developments with this it makes all of that stuff make so much more sense 
you know, you look at that, it's like, there we were all together hanging out, you know, and it was a researcher from some Danish Institute coming up with this new concept he wanted to share and take me over to your sim and I want to show you this. And I think about that in light of the Oculus Rift and the potential of virtual reality. And I think, you know, it's going to be here, here it comes, you know, this is, this is it. Second life was early. It was ahead of its time. It, technology like this is going to enable and facilitate entirely new generations of connecting people and sharing content and experiences. Unlike we've, we can imagine. Naturally, naturally everybody who I speak to, who, who is an early second life and then for, for whatever reason has moved on or moved, moved sideways or somewhere else, uh, speaks about second life in the past. Uh, I'm in it every day and I see uh, tremendous energy. I don't see a big influx. Actually, there is a little influx. The grid is growing. But I do see individuals uh, having tremendous value getting out of Second Life every single day. Do you believe there's a place for Second Life to play a role in this? Or, or not. I mean, you, you, you can be quite honest, you know. I mean, there's all sorts of opinions. Well, I, I think for me it was I, I wanted to enjoy a, a recreational component of, of enjoying a virtual reality environment and, and a vocational you know, capacity. And for me, the type of work that I was doing, and I was in a very admittedly margin niche sort of use case with architectural visualization, enterprise applications, and sort of, sort of that, that non-game serious game sort of space, that wasn't growing as rapidly for me as, as Unity was, you know, at the time that I sort of made a transition. I would love for that to come back for me in Second Life. I would love to get someone to, to offer an inquiry, to build something. We used to build whole sims, you know, for companies and organizations, schools, and all kinds of really fun stuff. And I just had a blast. I would give anything to have that back. Um, but I have to, to make a living at it. Maybe then Second Life is, for most people, a place, and, and maybe they should uh, position it more like that. Really kind of a play space that you can explore and self-express and maybe not go in with the intention to, to make money? Definitely, definitely. Well, and the other thing that Second Life has going for it is that they've solved a lot of the very toughest problems that the metaverse is going to face in the future. So I would not write off Second Life at all. I think the, the future is, is, is bright for, for that technology because they've, you know, they've solved the, the commerce. You know, that's an incredibly difficult, you know, and that's an ongoing issue for them that they're, they're working with. They've solved, you know, in-world content creation, you know, the primitives love them or hate them you can create an entire world actually now that i have the oculus and i played around i mean i'm not a builder but just raising a prim and actually looking in third person view with the oculus as a from a god position seeing my avatar interacting with the prims is absolutely mind-boggling for sure for sure you feel that sense of presence and when you walk up to someone's avatar in second life and you look at them in the eye it has a completely different experience than it used to when you were looking at an avatar on a screen in a very abstract way. In the Rift, you feel that. You feel them looking at you. You feel that you are there with that person. So that's that's just a very exciting, um, you know, application of it. It's just very, very, uh, very much looking forward to the future of that. Well, it's good that you uh, uh, that you haven't written off the um, the trouble the troubled child, the child who was uh, held back in ninth grade. Right. Well. You even the concept of owning land, you know, and actually having your own place and having permissions on the land that you can build things or not build things. And it, all of those things are just if, if new companies are going to emerge that try to solve all of that, it, they're going to realize I think they're going to have a, a lot, a lot more respect for, for Second Life and Linden Lab if anybody tries to tackle those problems. So that that's a good, good argument, I think, for Second Life having a new a new beginning, I think, with with the advent of virtual reality hardware. But now let's uh, let's speculate what Facebook will now do. Where where are they going to focus? And Corey and Draco, of course, formerly of Linden Lab, is is heading the mobile division. We all know that. Uh, what do you think that they will focus on? I personally think that the future of, of virtual reality is going to be on a mobile display. You know, you can already get these little templates, you know, that you cut out and put on your, your cell phone on any mobile display and actually turn it into 
into a virtual reality device. And these are just very early prototypes, but we've seen how fast this technology is evolving. If we look at two or three or five years out from now, that's that's going to be ubiquitous. You know, we'll have a very easy access point into virtual reality. Not everyone's going to have to run out and buy a big Oculus Rift development kit or anything. It's That's not the future of VR. I think it's going to be much more ubiquitous. That's right. So you're talking about, let's let's be clear, you're talking about a type of overlay over the real world, which is now called augmented reality. My personal opinion is it, it will merge anyway. Um, so you have all options open. Is, is that what you're talking about with mobile? Definitely, because you'll have cameras that face outward so you can see reality. And then you eventually start blending in the virtual reality into that. Um, and that's just, it, it seems obvious to me that that's the way it'll go, you know. But then at some point, you know, the, the, obviously, if you have the choice to be anywhere doing anything you can imagine, you know, your your immediate physical reality starts to have less and less relevance. <laughs> you know, if you can you'd be hanging out at a at a Parisian cafe, you know, would you would you rather be there or would you rather be working in your office? <laughs> it's, uh, it'll become interesting to see what people choose to do. So that is John Burchard's take, a take on things. Uh, now on to our other feature interview, Maria Korolov. And I taped this a couple of weeks ago. Maria is a journalist and a, and a metaverse evangelist. She blogs at hypergridbusiness.com. She's an expert when it comes to OpenSim. Uh, it's the open source, uh, open source alternative to Second Life, of course. And I also talked with uh, Maria about her open letter to Linden Lab. She published that on her blog a couple of months ago when Ebbe Altberg, the new CEO, came in. What the lab should, could, or must do rather to now to move forward in terms of public relations. A fascinating conversation. Quick note, when we conducted the conversation, Maria was a little sick, so you can hear that in her voice. We're very grateful for her time. Right now, virtual worlds are, for the most part, all isolated from each other. If you want to go from one world to another, you, you pretty much can't do that without starting over from scratch. There's a reason for that. You don't want to take your nuclear-powered uh, submarine and take it into World of Warcraft and just start nuking everybody. But when you have a general purpose social world, like say Second Life or There.com or IMVU or other 3D chat rooms, there's really no good reason from a user perspective why you have to have a different avatar on each one. So in a lot of ways, this is very similar to the situation we had before we had the web, where we had CompuServe, we had America Online, we had a whole bunch of other ISPs. And um, if you had an account on CompuServe, you couldn't talk to people in America Online. You couldn't even send email back and forth. Each one was a separate system. When the World Wide Web was invented, at first... America Online kind of ignored the World Wide Web because the web had nothing. America Online had everything. It had chat, shopping, forums, everything in one place. It was, it was super convenient. It had all the users. People were paying money to be on there. The World Wide Web, nobody was paying money for it. There was nobody there. There was a whole bunch of really crappy, lousy websites and a few academic sites where people posting papers and some conspiracy theorists putting up their own sites, but really nothing worth visiting. Over time, this shifted dramatically so that you still don't have any one site on the web that does everything that AOL did. But put together, the web became much bigger than America Online very quickly, and eventually America Online joined the web. So I think the same thing is happening right now with virtual worlds. Second Life is a closed, separate world. IMVU is a closed, separate world. Blue Mars is a closed, separate world. But we're starting to see the glimmers of interoperability. And that glimmer is something called the hypergrid, and it's all open source. It's free. You can download the software. You can set up a little server or an old computer. I, I have old computers that I have lying around the house that I use to run this. And you can create your own little virtual world, put it online. If you have a fast connection, you can put it up online. And anybody could visit it by teleporting in from their world. I'm currently tracking 
around 300 or so active grids that are running on the software. Each grid's a separate virtual world. And there's a couple of thousand other grids that I know of and an unknown number of grids that I don't know about because maybe they're running behind a firewall at a company or a school. They don't want the public to know or they're just a personal grid. They're not really advertising it. And over a hundred of these are connected by the hypergrid. So you can create one avatar and with this one avatar, you can teleport from one world to another world to another world. You can send messages to people in all these different worlds and you can give stuff to people in different worlds. You can go shopping in different worlds and bring stuff back to your home world. And uh, 2008, I think, someone posted this on our podcast, the video that Torley made. When Linden Lab and IBM were collaborating on connectivity between the Second Life Grid and OpenSIM. Can you recall why that ended those, those experiments? Yeah, I actually talked to the folks at IBM who were involved in it, and they were successfully able to accomplish a teleport from Second Life to an open SIM grid run by IBM. Now, the reason IBM wanted this was because they needed a version of this that they could run behind their firewall. And Second Life at the time did not run behind a firewall. It ran in the public. Uh, Second Life released their own version of this, the Second Life Enterprise. No, no, I, I know that. Let's not get too much into that. I think I'm assuming that this is somewhat public knowledge, at least to our listeners. Yeah. But do you know why they, why they didn't uh, continue this? This looked so promising at the time. I think it's because they got away from the idea of Second Life as an entry point to the metaverse and became focusing on the idea of Second Life as just another business. And, and when you have a bigger picture, this is very different than when you're focusing on the bottom line. And I believe that having a bigger vision would have been very positive for Second Life and Linden Labs. And by focusing on the bottom line in the very short term, by trying to make, you know, sell land and keep the land sales up and trying to have the business customers, they wound up missing the boat. Maybe they might recover still. Um, I don't know. But at the time, there was really no profit in them, possible losses for them for open sim connectivity and I don't think they had that long term view but it's water under the bridge as they say <laughs> since 2008 when the mainstream media still reported on virtual worlds mm -hmm. one thing that I always hear is that folks um, are including myself a little afraid of having to install something like OpenSIM on a local machine? You don't have to install OpenSIM. There are a number of hosting companies out there that will run OpenSIM for you. So it's like a website provider, basically. Exactly. There are quite, quite a few of them. Prices start at around $15 a month per region. So on average, OpenSIM land is going to be about the tenth the cost of Second Life for, for the same sort of prims and the same bandwidth for the same um, number of avatars. You're going to pay about a tenth of what you do, plus no setup costs. So in Second Life, you're paying a thousand bucks for setup costs and three hundred a month for a region. In OpenSIM, a reasonable region is going to give, cost you about 30 bucks a month with no setup costs. One of the comments on, on OpenSIM, or the, the, the sort of a dismissive comment that I hear among Second Lifers who enjoy Second Life or sometimes don't, um, they say there is no, there's no content, there's, there are no people on OpenSIM. There's, why would I go there? Yes, Second Life has quite a bit more people. So if you're looking for... A large number of people, like if you're selling content or performing music or you want to have a big public event, something like that, and you really want to have access to Second Life's base of a million users, you really need to go to Second Life. Now, if you're interested in building or role playing or holding online classes where you bring the people with you, then OpenSIM is going to give you way more land, way more features, 
more stability at a fraction of the price. And I was going to get to the education sector because they have a new CEO and you wrote an open letter to Linden Lab. And one thing that see uh, Ebbe Altberg already addressed um, in the interview, the education market was put off by the by the price hike. He's trying to get them back. Um, obviously, OpenSIM is a, is a real alternative. So when you set up a school grid, Say you, you can do it yourself if you have the technical skills. So you can hire somebody to do it all for you. You can email them a list of your students and they will instantly create all the avatars. You can create a custom viewer that only logs into your grid. You can upload only the content that you want to have up there if you have hypergrid turned off. So it's full control and you can make a backup of the entire grid or individual regions with just one button. You retain all all the intellectual property rights. Mm -hmm. You can have a grid, like say that has 100 regions, and 99 of those regions are private for grid residents only, and one region is facing the public. So people can teleport in, you can have little freebies and promotional stuff, and if they want to see the rest of your grid, they have to be a member of your school, or they have to be a registered student, or they have to get get an account on the grid, or, or pay membership, or whatever it is you want to do. Now, be before we talk about your take on the lack of adoption of virtual worlds in general, you wrote a blog post, open letter to Linda Lab, and I think you started it off with saying that you don't hate Second Life and, and you have some really, really great points there. If you would like to re recall some of these points now that we're again uh, have a new leader in, in the house um, who may look at things uh, fresh out of the box, what, what was your blog post about? Well, I think, and I've always thought this, that Second Life had the opportunity to become the gateway to the metaverse. The same way that AOL did. AOL had a massive marketing campaign. They basically forced people to go online. And the thing is, it was super difficult back then. We tend to forget that. We think, oh, Second Life is too hard. No, remember what the modems were like? How slow it was? How awful it was? How it constantly broke the connection? But we were willing to do this because we wanted to go online for the sexy chat rooms for, you know, emailing our grandparents. Well, whatever it was people went online for. There was an incentive and you saw it on the other end and that gave you the energy to go through all that AOL stuff. AOL really marketed the hell out of it. I mean, I don't know if you remember this. There were CDs inside cereal boxes. I do remember, yeah. That's when I came to the U.S. <laughs> at the, around that time. It was insane, those CDs. You could not buy anything without getting an AOL CD. Every computer that was shipped had AOL pre-installed. And, and it's still, they had, sh they pe only a fraction of people tried it. A lot of people who tried it didn't like it, didn't stick around, but they kept pushing it. And they laid the groundwork for people to go online. They laid the groundwork for the web. And I think that Second Life could do the same thing with a big marketing push. There are good reasons for people to go into a virtual world. You can do simulations, you can do games, you can do the interactive chats, you can do a lot, a lot of educational stuff that you cannot do in any other platform. Now, you don't want to go into a virtual world to show somebody some slides. You don't want to go into a virtual world to have a telephone conversation. But there are some unique things that you can do with simulations and around interactivity that are unique to virtual worlds. And the Second Life has some, some really strong users who love it, who really love it. And I came into this because I tried Second Life and I said, oh, my God, this is the most amazing thing. I, I really want to be involved in this. This is so cool. But the marketing has never been there. Second Life... Let the media do its marketing for it. I always want to figure out if it is a conscious decision by, by many Silicon Valley tech companies to rely on this word of mouth and super fan marketing, right? This is a significant issue in the tech space. There's a disdain for sales and marketing by a lot of people. And they point to the successes of word of mouth advertising. Often they miss what actually there's often this very strategic effort in the behind the scenes to do this to create a viral or a word of marketing product 
it usually takes more than just stepping back and letting it happen. AOL did not just happen. Even though on its surface, it's also a word of mouth product because you go in and then you bring your friends in because you want to, you want to communicate with them. But in practice, especially when you try to have behavior changes, it can take quite a bit of advertising and marketing to get people to realize that they need something new. Clearly, with the case of Second Life, the viral effect and the media hype was not enough. But it's also a fact that um, Second Life and OpenSIM and related technologies have really matured. I mean, there's also the matter of timing, and I think you addressed this too. It's it's a shame that uh, the tech press is so fixated on their narrative that they won't even revisit this technology. No, there's a reason not to revisit the Second Life technology, and that is that it's a shrinking user base. But that's see that's the vicious cycle. I mean, I would I would argue that the tech press, as the press is, it's a it's a gatekeeper. We they they write about something and then people read it and then they get interested in it. If the tech press, or the press as a whole, repeat that same narrative, why would why would it grow? Why would people go in? This it? is why people pay for advertising, is to set their own narrative. Second Life never set its own narrative. It, the news media is looking for something new. There's nothing for news media to write about. People don't want to read things that they already know about, that are old hat. They want to read new things. So, for example, right now, if you look at, uh, say, Facebook coverage, Facebook is buying up these companies in order to remain relevant. And there's still a giant, giant place, right? Everybody already knows who they are. You don't need a story introducing Facebook to people. You have to create your own narrative. You have to correct the narrative as a company if the if the narrative is wrong. And should Linden Lab do that now or should they wait a little bit? It depends on their strategy. If they want to be the gateway to the metaverse, if they want to be the PayPal of the metaverse, which they could be, if they want to be the search, the Google of the metaverse, which they could be, if they want to be the, the portal, the, the, the Yahoo of the metaverse, which they could be, they could be all of these things. But that means that instead of saying, oh, our pie is shrinking, how much money can we eke out of it while it's still hot versus so let's say we're going to have a smaller slice, but of a huge big thing, how, how can we do that? And and you write in your piece uh, because of the convergence now or the advent of the of the new hardware interfaces the time to say yes to um, maybe being the lead again in the metaverse in exchange for maybe a little smaller piece of pipe and it seems to, to me or to all of us uh, that virtual reality is not a dirty word anymore either uh, i totally agree with you the oculus rift has the potential to be really really transformative the way say the iphone and the ipad were transformative You have to take a big risk. Google took a big risk with the Android platform, which they open sourced, hoping that eventually, someday, they will make money from advertising through this channel. They had faith that eventually this would grow to the point where it's going to make them money. And Apple had the same faith that eventually this is grow to the point where it's going to make money. But it's a giant risk. And right now, Second Life, Linden Lab isn't taking that risk. OpenSim and all virtual worlds could be the content that the hardware devices are looking for because right now, the hardware devices certainly don't have connected worlds or anything resembling a universe. The combination of OpenSim, Second Life, and the Oculus Rift could be the beginnings of the metaverse. And without this, there's the potential that somebody else will create from scratch a new platform for the Oculus Rift that Microsoft will do it or Google will do it. Or Philip Rosedale. Or Philip Rosedale or one of these video game companies will step up and say, listen, we're like, we, we know the Oculus Rift. This is so cool. We want to make get this technology into everybody's hands so everybody can have a virtual world. Let's do this. Sony might do this. Uh, who, who knows who will do this? What is your take on the lack of adoption overall? I mean, probably every one of us has similar stories where we 
try to explain what virtual worlds can do. We see the mouth water on the other side and then there is absolutely no interest, no follow-up or there is an eye roll right away. Uh, you're probably too young to remember this, but there used to be a time when we were all using text-based interfaces. You had to type DOS commands. Remember? No, that I don't. There used to be a time when you, in order to open up a folder, you had to do cd, c colon, slash, docs, right? So back, back in those days. Now, when you took, took a business person who was used to using spreadsheets and were processing documents, and you showed them the Mac or the Apple II, and I, and I, and I, I, was, I remember I was a programmer back in those days, they looked at it and they said, This is a toy for kids. Ah, I see where you're going. There mm -hmm. is no way you're going to have me using a mouse and do this because the DOS command is so fast and so powerful. And this mouse clicks thing, you can only do a tenth of what you can do in DOS. And I've, I've spent all this time learning all these commands. I'm super fast at it. And this thing is a toy for kids. So what happened was that uh, Microsoft took a leap of faith. They released Windows and they basically forced everyone to upgrade. A lot of people really, really, really hated it because they knew DOS. DOS is faster. And we, we have the same exact attitude today. This is a toy. This is for games. Okay, fine, simulations are nice, but basically, you know, or desktop publishing is nice is what people used to say. Well, I can see using a map for desktop publishing. But other than that, no real person would have this in their office. And to this day, if you go into a company, the only place you will find Macs is the desktop publishing, the, the graphics department. Now, if, if you look at a video game, Pac-Man or something like that, it is a lot faster to navigate on a flat screen than to navigate in a 3D world. So if you were to say, take a, and we don't have this yet, but if you were to say, take your operating system, your windows and make it into a 3D environment, it's going to be a little slower. It's going to be more intuitive because you're going to have, you're not going to have to learn how to use the, the mouse. It's going to be more gesture based, you know, more natural interfaces. And somebody, and I don't know if it's going to be Google or if it's going to be Microsoft, it's going to be Apple or somebody out of left field is going to come out with a 3D operating system. And at some point, everybody will switch over to this 3D operating system because it's more engaging. You've been using AOL as an example of what what went right. And that's a, is a fabulous um, comparison, as you pointed out. But a lot of people use AOL actually as a, as a negative example of how things shouldn't work, the walled garden and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, AOL dropped the ball. AOL had the opportunity to become a lot more than it was. Embracing the web would have been a big risk. The company did not take that risk and it wouldn't have been irrelevant. So there's no, you know, moral imperative here for Second Life to succeed. You know, somebody else could just, just as well come in. Second Life didn't do as big a part as AOL did. It could have done a lot more. It had the opportunity, it had a, a lot of momentum and it didn't uh, do a fraction of what AOL did. Let's just use the present tense and end on a positive note. <laughs> Second Life and Virtual Worlds as a whole, the whole segment has great opportunity if they play their cards right right now, if they pick up the phone and call all these 23-year-old whiz kids who are developing all the hardware interfaces and talk to them because that's another fascinating fact that they're not even aware of the worlds that are out there. I spoke to Palmer Luck a little bit on Facebook here and then and he has uh, said in two interviews, I think, oh yeah, I don't know, Second Life, I was in there once to buy some bitcoins on a street corner. <laughs> But I talked to him about OpenSim in Boston a couple of months back when he was here for a conference. A few other people there who also knew about OpenSim and who could see the potential of it. Because right now, if you want to create an environment for the Oculus Drift, you have to be a professional developer. And you have to use Unity or one of the bigger engines for it. Whereas OpenSim, anybody could set it up and have their own virtual world that people can visit with the Oculus Rift. That's the empowering aspect that unites, again, OpenSim and Second Life, that the user can actually be the, has agency over, over their creation versus just uh, plopping into a game that was created by someone else. Yeah. 
And, and that was also the, I think, the aspect of the World Wide Web. Whereas AOL was a little bit more like, uh, say, Facebook. You know, you can like post things on there. You can send email, but you can't couldn't really create and control your own environment. And on the web, you could create and control your own website fully. And OpenSIM allows you to do that. To allow you to create and fully control your whole world, everything about it. And I think that's amazing. If somebody comes out with a cheap easy to use, user-friendly world creation tool that's compatible with Oculus Drift from day one, that's cloud-based, like, uh, so you go online and you just do this. Um, if it's cheap and easy enough, it could become the de facto standard for virtual worlds, and we might have a proprietary commercial metaverse. I would much rather have an open one so that was Maria Korolov. She's really laying it at the feet of Linden Lab with ideas to reposition the company. Uh, Joe, is OpenSim or the hypergrid now, especially in light of the Oculus Facebook deal, a, a viable alternative? Yeah, she's made it seem uh, sound a lot more interesting. Um, although I, I have to repeat that to me, in the end, uh, having lots of visitors is important. She acknowledges that. And I also completely agree that there should be a, a metaphors and that Linden Lab should really open up the roads uh, out of Second Life, because it would be fantastic if the open grid and Second Life would be just one teleport away from each other. Why not? Maybe that's exactly the thing that they're now looking at, sort of antidote to the close proprietary metaphors that Facebook may be building. Yeah, or, you know, maybe uh, Facebook is going to buy both of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Then we're really screwed. What I did not realize up until this moment, until she told us about it, is that you can have your own SIM and pretty much lock it off, uh, block it off from the end, from everyone except the people that you want to share it with. And you can do that in Second Life, but in a completely different way. That makes it very good for educational purposes uh, because I don't know many schools who would gladly allow their children or pupils uh, to go on to Second Life because, you know, one teleport uh, and you're in hell. Absolutely. And Linda Lab needs to get back in the educational um in the educational game, and I think they, they, they surely realize this. They have to offer educational companies and things like that. They have to offer them more than just a discount. They need help. They need to figure out why people can't use Second Life for education and then help them figure it out. Yeah, also they really, I mean, I think educators really also need to be assured that their kids don't have to wear bikinis while they're in school. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, no matter what advertising says, you don't have to. <laughs> the bikini is absolutely optional. All right, we're running out of time. What are you uh, up to this weekend? Any tips? Um, well, yes, I'm going to visit another sim again suggested by Inara Pei, sim called the Pil Pilgrim's Dawn. Um, and it's really interesting because, you know, it, it is a lovely countryside and it's spring and there's flowers. It's just very pretty. And I think I can make a few pictures there for uh, the Second Life is Looking Good Flickr group. Apparently, we all, all, all only read Inara all day long because uh, um, the Freedom Project, which we forgot to mention last time. And I wish that folks who organized the Freedom Project, uh, the University of Western Australia, which they do a lot for Second Life that uh, folks would call us or leave a message before we go to we, before we go to air. Um, the Freedom Project is a project, um, a, a 2D and 3D art and film event. I'm reading off Inara's blog. And the project extended an invitation to artists suffering from a disability or chronic illness. And uh, so they were tasked and invited to create art or film describing how the virtual world, virtual life has enabled them to engage in activities and interact with others. This is such a great, great story that needs to get uh, much more play out there. Um, also, real quick, people may know that prominent Second Life fashion designer Munchflower Zeus is looking for donors because she has uh, been diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. You can read more about that on, on her page. And uh, she uh, is looking for donations uh, to pay her medical expenses. And a lot 
of money has come in from the Second Life community, but more and more is needed. Also, lastly, the U.S. government is recognizing Bitcoin. I got that from Ash Westar. The U.S. government recognizes Bitcoin, so you have to pay taxes on it. It's, it's, it's recognized as a property. So read up on, on a website called Botcoin.org. Wow. Uh, oh, dear, oh, dear. Do we have to? We live in such a great world. What, okay. what kind of language is that? All right, all right. We're so running out of time. We got to go. Uh, remember, leave a message on Skype and tell us about Facebook and Oculus and the future of virtual worlds. And you might want to leap motion. And that's it for this week. Thank you, Joel. Have a good weekend and bye. You too. Auf Wiedersehen. The Drax Files Radio Hour with Joe Yardley is a weekly production of Basic Drax Entertainment. The show is supported by Leap Motion, Carville Design, Vika Creations, Humanoid Animations, Escapades, Botanical, Death Row Designs, Nantra, Angel Red Couture, and Landscapes Unlimited. Special thanks to one anonymous customer from Pavel's Bakery getting us into the show today. Contact the show via Skype, Drax Files, Avatar Drax Files, or email radio at draxfiles.com. And where would, where would you first go? Hawaii would be fun to yeah. go to our space. Now, if I tell you that the maker of these goggles are now owned by Facebook, um, does that make any difference how you feel about them? Uh, makes me want to not wear them. Really? Yeah. Yeah? I don't like how it's a window into all these people's lives that you really don't see on a regular basis. Like, that's not for me. Virtual Venice would have to wait. I think I just have to go to Venice for real. <laughs>